Aside from devices that intentionally add color by changing the frequency response or adding distortion, it's generally accepted that audio gear should aim to be transparent. This is easily tested by measuring the above four parameters with various test signals. They're not even doing science because they're not spending the time to observe the effect. Is that triangle hit clearer because you recently added a power conditioner, or simply because you never noticed it playing before? If it weren't for science, we'd all be banging on tree stumps in a dark cave. Hi, I'm Nathan Oakley, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the claims of science made by GR Research, a YouTuber who I really enjoy looking at his measurements and maths for the crossovers he builds to improve and upgrade loudspeakers that he gets sent in. So he designs these kits, measures them, shows the results, and then sells them. He's now moved over to selling audiophile cable, which is a completely unregulated part of the audiophile industry. And there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and snake oil that goes into it. Now, in the case of audiophile grade, mains conditioners, these things make no improvement. They absolutely are surplus to requirements if you have a correctly designed amplifier. Now, I had actually intended to respond to this guy on his last video when he got a flat earth t-shirt sent to him and started referring to people who don't think cables make a difference as flat earthers. Now, that wasn't enough for me to actually get involved and make a video, although I did get halfway through editing one. But in his most recent video, he's now claiming science. In other words, he's claiming he has science to back this complete snake oil nonsense that he's punting instead of the crossovers he usually builds with measurements to back them. Now measurements are maths. Science is an application of the scientific method to establish the cause of a naturally occurring phenomena by way of hypothesis-based systematic experimentation. It absolutely is not listening to stuff nor is it measuring stuff. Again when this guy in the past has described measuring things as science, not enough for me to pick up on. But when he's using science to punt cables and referring people who don't believe him to be flat earthers, that's where I'm going to get involved. So you're going to see a video from him making his claim and that's going to be followed by a video by an excellent YouTuber and acoustician called Ethan Weiner. So I've trimmed out one of his videos. Links to both will be in the description box below this video. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you all in the next it's one. like a lot for a cable when, when you're at the budget levels. And for a lot of you guys, it may seem that way, but if you try it, and you listen to it and you feel like that it's worth it, then it's worth it. What I'm gonna do with you guys is offer a money back guarantee on these cables. Let these things burn in for a week or two. Yeah, they have to burn in. I know that's gonna make the flat earth guys' heads explode because they don't think cables burn in, but this polyethylene uh, dielectric material takes a while to form. It's gonna change a little bit over time. Try it and listen. Don't listen to the guys out there that are trying to tell you double blind tests and measurements and this, and we can't measure this. They're not even measuring the right thing. They're not even doing science because they're not spending the time to observe the effect. It means they're not even they're not even listening to see if the result matches the theory. You have to listen. This is all about listening. The whole hobby is about listening and enjoying listening to music. So you gotta listen. There are even audiophile grade USB cables costing hundreds of dollars. More important, why do people think they hear a difference, always an improvement of course, with such products? Through my research in room acoustics, I believe the acoustic phenomenon known as comb filtering is one plausible explanation for many of the differences people claim to hear from cables, power conditioners, mechanical isolation devices, low jitter external clocks, ultra high sample rates, replacement power cords and fuses, and so forth. Comb filtering is a specific type of frequency response error that occurs when direct sound from the loudspeakers combines in the air with reflections off the walls, floor, ceiling, and other nearby objects. This graph shows the response I measured 18 inches away from a reflecting sheetrock wall. In this graph in the previous one, you can see the repeating pattern of equally spaced peaks and deep nulls. 
The peak and null frequencies are related to the delay time, which in turn is related to the distance of the reflecting surfaces. This particular graph compares the response measured with and without absorption at the sidewall reflection points in my living room. Peaks and deep nulls occur at predictable quarter wavelength distances, and at higher frequencies it takes very little distance to go from a peak to a null. For example, at 7 kHz, a quarter wavelength is less than half an inch. At these higher frequencies, reflections from a nearby coffee table or even a leather seat back can make a big change in the frequency response at your ears. Because of comb filtering due to multiple reflections in a room, moving even a tiny distance changes the response a lot, especially in small rooms having no acoustic treatment. The response at any given cubic inch location in a room is the sum of the direct sound from the speakers, plus many competing reflections all arriving from different directions. This graph shows the frequency response for two locations in the same room only four inches apart, yet it looks like different speakers in a totally different room. Keeping what truly matters in perspective, it makes little sense to obsess over microscopic amounts of distortion in an A to D converter when most loudspeakers have at least ten times more distortion. This graph shows the first five individual components measured from a loudspeaker playing a 50 Hz tone. When you add them up, the total THD is 6.14%, and this doesn't include the IM products we'd also have if there were two or more source frequencies. Likewise, compared to even very modest gear, all domestic size rooms have huge variations in low frequency response, comb filtering from untreated reflections, and substantial ringing at a dozen or more modal frequencies. This graph shows the low frequency response at high resolution as measured in a bedroom sized space. Does it make sense to obsess over gear when listening environments are by comparison so much worse? As audio professionals, we should strive for the highest quality possible, of course, but it's important to keep things in perspective and be practical. My intent is not to belabor the importance of acoustics, but to put in perspective what parts of a playback system do the most damage. Most sensible people will aim to improve the weakest link first. There's also anti-science bias by those who believe specs don't matter and science doesn't know how to measure what they are certain they can hear. One minor side note here. Unfortunately, both Ethan and GR Research are sisters in pseudoscience when it comes to claiming maths as an adherence to the scientific method. Sorry, Ethan. If it weren't for science, we'd all be banging on tree stumps in a dark cave. As JJ explained, every time you play a recording, it sounds a little different. Further... If you move your head even an inch or two, the frequency response can change substantially due to acoustic comb filtering, especially in an untreated room. And the more you hear a piece of music, the more likely you'll notice details previously missed. Is that triangle hit clearer because you recently added a power conditioner, or simply because you never noticed it playing before? Understanding that test gear is far more reliable and repeatable than human hearing is the last frontier in stamping out audio myths. Ultimately, these are consumerist issues, and I accept that people have a right to spend their money however they choose. I'm not opposed to paying more for real value. Parts and build quality, features, reliability, and even appearance cost more. For example, some DI boxes cost $30 and others cost 10 times more. If I'm an engineer at Universal Studios recording movie scores, which can cost hundreds of dollars per minute just for the musicians, I will not buy cheap junk that might break at the worst time. My only aim here is to explain what affects audio fidelity, to what degree of audibility, and why. The following four parameters define everything needed to assess high-quality audio reproduction. Frequency response, distortion, noise, time-based errors. There are subsets of these parameters. For example, under distortion, there's harmonic distortion, IM distortion, or intermodulation distortion, and digital aliasing. Noise encompasses tape hiss, hum and buzz, vinyl crackles, and cable handling noise known as the triboelectric effect. Time-based errors are wow and flutter from vinyl records and tape respectively, and jitter in digital systems. Aside from devices that intentionally add color by changing the frequency response or adding distortion, it's generally accepted that audio gear should aim to be transparent. This is easily tested by measuring the above four parameters with various test signals. If the frequency response is flat to less than one-tenth dB from 20 Hz to 20 kHz, and the sum of all noise and distortion is at least 100 dB below the music, a device can be said to be audibly transparent. A device that's transparent will sound the same as every other transparent device, whether a microphone preamp or DAW summing algorithm. 
Of course, transparency is not the only goal of audio gear. Euphonic distortion can be useful as glue, but there's no need for magic. Transformers can add distortion, tubes can add distortion, tape distorts if you record at high levels, but do we really need to spend thousands of dollars on boutique gear to get these effects? Are there other more practical and affordable ways to get the same or similar results? Regardless, it's impossible to argue about the subjective value of gear color, so I won't even try. Although product specs can indeed tell us everything we need to know, many specs are incomplete, misleading, and sometimes even fraudulent. But this doesn't mean specs cannot tell us everything that's needed to assess transparency. We just need all of the data. Common techniques to mislead include using third octave averaging for microphone and loudspeaker response, and specifying a frequency response with no plus or minus dB range, or using very large divisions like 10 or 20 dB each to make a ragged response look more flat. I measured this loudspeaker from about a foot away in a fairly large room. This graph shows the true responses measured, with no averaging. This graph shows the exact same data, but with third octave averaging applied. This graph shows the same average data again, but at 20 dB per vertical division to make the loudspeaker look flatter than it really is. Which version looks more like what speaker makers publish? Masking is a well-known principle by which a loud sound can hide a softer sound if both sounds have similar frequencies. <laughs> 